So, how does it feel when you play Roll Up to Win with Tim Hortons? Buy a hot or cold beverage using the Tim's app and find out. Roll in the app for a chance to win prizes ranging from free coffee and donuts to a Universal Orlando Resort vacation or a sweet car. Oh, don't forget the TV. And this year, every roll is a shot at a $1,000 daily giveaway drawing for two $500 prizes. Roll up to win and get treated by Tim's. No purchase necessary. Account registration required. 50 U.S. and D.C. 18 plus enter by 4223. See rules at rolluptowin.com for free entry of full details. Void in Florida and where prohibited. All new spring deals are here at Lowe's. Get top deals on everything you need to freshen up your yard, like the Cobalt 24-volt String Trimmer and Leaf Blower Combo Kit, only at Lowe's. Was $199, now just $149. Plus, get your lawn in shape with up to $15 off select Scott's Easy Seed Lawn Repair Mixes. Lowe's knows spring. Lowe's knows home improvement. Offers valid through 517. Selection varies by location. While supplies last, Scott's offer excludes Alaska and Hawaii. Live from Liverpool, the Dark Paranormal, Season 11. Hello listeners, and welcome back to the Dark Paranormal, Season 11. I genuinely can't thank each and every one of you enough for all of your kind words, messages and support following our season opener last week, A Darkness in the Woods. We've been inundated with theories around just what was inside those woods that were discussed last week. We've had everything from nature spirits to the Fae, to those who do believe it was the spirits of the bodies buried underneath. And if anything, it kind of exemplifies the message that we try and put across on the dark paranormal. No one knows. But the wonderful thing about this very topic is it allows us to debate our potential theories on what may or may not be taking place. This is and will always remain your show. A safe place that you can share both your true paranormal experiences and your thoughts and theories on the topic. So if you do have an opinion or a theory on any of the true paranormal experiences that we will cover in Season 11 then I'd love to hear them. And the email address is the same one that you can submit your experiences to. And that is thedarkparanormal at hotmail.com. Or you can visit our website, thedarkparanormal.com, and click the Contact Us link. And if you're so inclined, that website is also where you can pick up your Dark Paranormal merchandise. But what we all want to know is, what are we going to be looking at today? Well... I'll be exceptionally truthful with you when I say there are very few experiences where the visual that I'm given stays with me for a good while. But that's certainly been the case for today's true paranormal experience. And there's a specific reason for that. You see, without giving too many spoilers away, the paranormal protagonist within this tale, although described perfectly by the submitter, for some reason, appears very different in my brain. And that's the wonderful, yet terrifying, part of this subject, is that I guarantee by the end of this episode, we will all have our own personal version of this spirit living in our minds. But let's quickly catch our breath before we run headfirst into this terrifying tale and say a huge thank you to our newest team members over at Patreon. When you sign up to Patreon, not only do you receive these episodes both ad-free and before everyone else, but you can also gain exclusive access to the Patreon-only podcast, Dark Bites. Dark Bites is a show which is released each and every week of the year, even on the downtime between seasons, which means you never have to miss your paranormal fix. And there are currently well over 60 hours worth of Patreon-only content for you to go and binge. If you ever wonder what happens to the stories which are too short to make a full Dark Paranormal episode, well, they find a home and an audience on Dark Bites. And if you think, well, I don't want to download another app, etc., well, don't worry. 
You can place the feed for the Patreon shows directly into your podcatcher of choice. So, for example, I use Apple and the shows download each and every week directly into that feed. No need to open another app. We've built a wonderful community of like-minded paranormal enthusiasts over at Patreon. And we'd love to extend an exclusive invitation just for you. Simply head over to patreon.com forward slash the dark paranormal. Just like our wonderful new team members have. Melissa Goodine, Devin Hazelwood, Candice Gobiel, Adriana, Jada Boo, Charlotte, Raina Kirshner, Bree Wyant, Roger Rucala, Porterhouse, Exes Elmore, Andreas Turtle to Highguard, Ryan Rolls, Chris Wright, Marina Greenaway, Mandy LEC, Brandon Smith, Emma Ravenhope, Victoria Embry, Emily Autumn, Bell Cannon, Susan McClendon, Cynthia Brenner, Jennifer Bernal Senior, Diane, Jessica Chalice, Sarah Townsend, Chelsea Conn, Michelle Batista, John Stallion, Kimmy, Denise Povich, Kushla Flynn, Diane, Samantha Davis, Zilla Bonza, Archie Kovacic, Jackie Graham, Camille Garud, Maria Winchell, Ashley Storostka, Melissa Potter, Carol Ann Douglas, Jesse Blakey and Susan Slavic. Thank you so very much guys for supporting the show and I hope you enjoy all the early release content and of course those Dark Bites episodes. Don't forget, if you'd like to join the team, head over to patreon.com forward slash the dark paranormal. But right now, it's time. Lower those lights. Make yourself comfortable and, of course, leave your disbelief at the door as we hear all about the sinister revenant. Firstly, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate the care and seriousness with which you present this type of material. In my experience, one of the biggest struggles that people face when sharing their own paranormal tale is being treated as though they're mad, or just making things up for attention, if not just dismissed outright. Therefore, having a show that not only gives a voice to those who've experienced truly terrifying encounters, but also treats the accounts with respect and a willingness to believe, is more precious than I can ever express. That said, I've decided to take a leap of faith and share my paranormal experience with you. I've sincerely never shared these experiences with anyone but my younger sister, my closest confidant, literally out of fear of being made fun of, I've also deliberately kept some of the details of my story vague to protect the privacy of myself and my family. I hope you decide to feature it on the show. I'd be thrilled. But in all honesty, I'm just finally happy to have a place to tell it and get it all off my chest once and for all. For as long as I can remember... I've had a fascination with all things paranormal. Now, whether this affinity for the unexplained caused the events I'm about to describe, or it was brought about as a byproduct of my experiences, I may never know. It's my own personal chicken or the egg situation. My first major brush with the paranormal took place when I was barely five years old. It was 1985, and my family and I were renting a home in a small Tennessee town. It was going to be the first time I would have my own bedroom, as we'd been living in a cramped apartment until then. I remember being so excited. Excited about setting up my own bedroom. Excited having my own furniture. Putting all my toys and books wherever I wanted. My excitement, however, was short-lived. You see, less than a week after moving in, I began sleepwalking. Now, this was really strange because, well, I'd never done it before. And what's more, I would never do it again in any of our future homes. My mother assumed it was a phase I would grow out of, but she also said she would hear me walking up and down the hall at all hours of the night, talking to someone 
or something that she could never see. Now, I have no memory of these incidents and maybe would never have known if my mother hadn't mentioned it. But it wasn't long before I became sleep-deprived and irritable. Because in addition to my sleepwalking, my rest was constantly interrupted by being pinched by unseen fingers. I would actually wake up to find visible marks on my body the next morning. As you might expect, these constant disturbances led to me knocking on my parents' door and pleading with them to let me sleep in their room. But even that didn't stop the sleepwalking or the injuries. I could kind of deal with all this, but then I started seeing the entities responsible. One night, whilst curled up next to my mother, I was trying to go to sleep when I heard a soft scratching near the foot of the bed. Slowly, I raised my head to see what might be making the noise. What I saw was a small, child-sized shadow, blacker than natural black, like the complete absence of light. It didn't walk, but glided from the foot of the bed to the closet door where it was joined by another shadow figure of a similar size and shape. These figures just stood outside the closet door, staring at me. They had no visible eyes, and yet I knew they were looking right at me. I must have cried out or jumped because my mother was suddenly awake, asking me what was wrong. I tried to explain, through tears, what I'd seen, but it was quickly dismissed as nothing more than a bad dream. But I knew better. And it was proven a few nights later. My parents and baby brother were all sound asleep, but I'd stayed awake well past midnight. Somehow I just knew those things would be coming and I decided that if they did, I needed to stand up for myself. I froze, as in the dim light, I realised they were trying to creep, unnoticed, through the door. I stared at them as defiantly as I could, and I said, Stop! They immediately froze. I'm not afraid of you, so stop trying to scare me. This, of course, was a complete lie. I was terrified. But there was no response from these figures. They only continued staring at me with their blank, featureless faces. You're mean! Get out of my room now! I shouted at them. Far from running off, I watched as these things slowly faded from view almost like they were dissolving. My mother, having heard me shout out, came into my room with an irritated look on her face. She was tired of being jolted out of her sleep in the middle of the night, and I honestly can't blame her. I got into a bit of trouble for waking her, but it was worth it in the end. I would still see them in the hallway if I left my room to use the toilet at night, but from that night on, those things kept their distance. And we stayed there for another year without any further issues that I know of. Over the summer of 1988, my parents decided we needed to leave Tennessee. We moved eight hours north to my father's hometown in Indiana. He'd been raised in an extremely small town in the northeastern part of the state. The area was almost exclusively farmland, made up of flat fields of corn and soybeans. You could see for miles. 
but it certainly wasn't much to look at after spending my early years in the foothills of Tennessee. Being so close to the Great Lakes, this town would often see snow by October and things wouldn't thaw out until April. The winters were bitterly cold and turned the already drab landscape into something even more, well, eerie. The few visible clusters of trees looked downright skeletal after losing their leaves, and the sound of a harsh winter wind blowing through their branches, well, it was enough to send chills down your spine. The house my parents bought was on a quiet street, just a short walk from the elementary school that I would be attending. I didn't get to see the house until moving day, but my mother promised me it was everything we'd been looking for. By now I had a baby sister as well as a little brother, and this house was large enough to accommodate us all. The only problem was that it was quite old, and needed a lot of updating before we could really be comfortable. So my parents immediately set about fixing up the place for our family. To be quite honest, I didn't like the house from the very beginning. I didn't know how to articulate it at the time, but I now know that I was feeling some extremely negative energy. Something that was here a long time before our renovations began. It felt like walking into someone else's home, uninvited. The sensation of being watched was almost constant, and I soon learnt why. The house was a two-storey structure with a full basement. The first level of the house consisted of the living room, the dining room, kitchen and bathroom. The second floor held two bedrooms and a small door to access the attic. The door to the basement was in the kitchen and led down a narrow stairwell into three unfinished rooms. Basements are frightening to children at the best of times, but this basement was like something out of a horror movie. Crumbling stone walls with scraps of magazine photos or newspaper clippings plastered all over them. Small, filmy windows that scarcely let in any light, and a pervasive, intense cold. The middle of the three rooms held our washing machine and dryer, an old well access hole, and a butcher's shower. If you're not familiar with the term, a butcher's shower... It's a shower head and drain, sometimes enclosed, sometimes not, to be used when coming in from either a day of hunting and processing a kill, or from any other physical work that might leave a person covered in filth. Farmers would often use them to clean up at the end of the day, to avoid dragging any mess around the house. Ours was just an exposed pipe, fitted with an old rusty shower head, and a simple drain opening in the floor. The well access hole was to the left of this shower, and, for reasons I will never understand, my parents never bothered to cover it. The room was the only one without any windows. It relied on a single light bulb connected to a pull chain, and whatever ambient light spilt through from the other two rooms to illuminate the space. In such dim lighting, the well looked like a bottomless pit, waiting to swallow our young bodies if we came too close. When we moved into the house, my parents put my siblings and I in the two upstairs bedrooms and turned one of the basement rooms into a makeshift bedroom for themselves, while they set about remodelling the dining room to convert it into a master suite and it was when this work began that I saw her for the first time. I'd gone into the basement to take some clothes to do the laundry, when I had the distinct feeling someone was standing behind me. I put the bundle of clothes into the laundry bin and slowly turned around. 
there, standing in the corner, near the well access, was an elderly woman. She was short and slightly plump, wearing a faded house coat and slippers. Her wiry salt and pepper hair stood up around her head in dishevelled clumps. Her face was broad, with drooping cheeks and a small round nose. It may not have been such a disturbing sight if it hadn't been for her eyes. You see, where the old woman's eyes ought to have been, there were just two black pits. It looked like some sort of inky liquid was dripping out of them, like tears staining her cheeks, her neck, her clothes. Her hands hung limp at her sides, and whilst her mouth hung open in a sort of vacant expression, what I felt emanating from her was nothing less than sheer, unadulterated hate. I completely froze in place. Whatever I'd been expecting to see, this wasn't it. In my head, I was screaming at myself to run, but it was like my body just refused. I felt a hand close around my wrist, and then I did scream out loud. But it was my sister. She'd come looking for me when I didn't come back upstairs. I snapped my vision back to where the old woman was standing, but she was gone. I asked my sister if she'd seen her. She shook her head no, and begged for me to come and play. As much as I wanted to know I wasn't crazy or imagining things, as an adult, I'm now so glad that my little sister, who was only three at the time, didn't see anything so horrible. I told myself to never mention the old lady to either of my siblings. I just couldn't scare them like that. I avoided the basement as much as possible after that, but I could now feel the old lady all throughout the house. But for some reason, she would only manifest herself there, in the basement. Every time I did have to go to the basement, there she would be. Sometimes in the laundry room, sometimes waiting by the stairs. She never spoke, or even made a sound, but I could always feel the hateful, angry energy rolling out of her in waves. My father was doing all the remodelling of our house himself, and he worked long hours at a factory during the day, so the progress on the house was slow. The master suite took close to six months to finish. During that time... I found ways to cope with my unpleasant housemate, and nothing escalated beyond the occasional basement encounter. So it should be no surprise that I was very upset to learn that his next project would be the upstairs bedrooms, which meant one thing. I would be moving to the basement whilst my room was under construction. The fact it was temporary was little comfort. I put up a fuss, but neither of my parents could be persuaded to let me stay where I was. You see, I wasn't just worried about myself. I was scared out of my mind for my brother and my sister. They were so little, and I was extremely protective of them. I'd been the only one to see this old lady so far, and the idea of her appearing to them had me terrified. You may well be asking why I didn't just tell my mum and dad about the old lady. Well, it's simple, really. I knew they wouldn't believe me. When I tried to tell them about the shadow figures and the pinching in our other house, I was told I had an overactive imagination, and my injuries were just the result of me being clumsy. I love my parents very much, but they've always been very dismissive about paranormal experiences, 
So it didn't take me long for me to stop telling them about bad things that happened to me, paranormal or otherwise, because it was safe to say they wouldn't take me seriously. My parents put a set of bunk beds for my siblings in the first room off the basement stairs and set up a bed for me where their temporary bedroom had been. There were no doors to close off one room from another, which I was thankful for. You see, I wanted to be able to get my brother and sister quickly if the old lady came after them. Fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, she never showed herself to anyone but me. Every night for months, I would wait until the last possible second before going downstairs to my room. And I was getting in trouble with my parents for staying up late every night. I realised I was going to have to do something. I decided to try telling her to just go away, like I did with the shadow figures in the old house. I thought, it worked with them. It should work with her too, right? Wrong. Very fucking wrong. Not only did standing up to her do nothing to stop her appearing, it seemed to have only pissed her off. Now, instead of just lurking in the corners, I would find her sitting on my bed during the night, glaring at me. Occasionally, she would even rush at me from the other side of the room, baring her teeth like an animal, only for her to vanish inches from my face. I think she not only knew how much this all scared me, but she enjoyed it, reveled in it even. The whole situation was a nightmare, and I started spending as much time as possible outside or at friends' houses to get away from her. One day, I came home from school to find that my dad had finally finished the upstairs rooms and my parents had spent the day moving all our furniture up from the basement. I started to cry when I realised I wouldn't have to face the old lady anymore. My mother hugged me thinking I was just really happy about my new room and how it looked. It was beautiful, and I had butterfly curtains and fresh paint, but my reaction had nothing to do with that room. That same weekend, my grandmother came to visit. She and my mum were having coffee in our living room and talking about all the updates to the house, whilst my dad watched a football game. My sister and I were laying on the living room floor, colouring together. I'm surprised you could sleep down there, let alone the kids, my grandmother said. I glanced up and saw a confused look on my mother's face. Why is that? she asked. Well, Mrs Bixler, Grandma answered. Who? my mum asked. Upon realising that my mother had no idea who or what she was talking about, my grandma shot a disappointed look at my father and said, You didn't tell her. What's the matter with you? You see, Mrs Bixler, it turned out, was the previous owner. Her son had sold my parents the house after she passed away. Well, why would that make it hard to sleep in the basement, you may ask? Well, because that's where she died. She'd gone down to the basement to do laundry and suffered a stroke. She collapsed under the butcher's shower, dying where she fell. Grandma had known her and said she was a horrible woman. She'd been widowed at a young age, raising her children alone, and it was known that she was abusive to them. So no one in town blamed them for more or less ignoring her when they became adults. Contact between them was apparently so rare that she lay dead on the basement floor for more than a week before her son finally found her. My grandma whispered all of this to my mother, 
whose coffee cup was now frozen mid-air from shock. Mum was understandably angry and asked my dad why he never told her anything about it. He just rolled his eyes as though he didn't see a problem. I said nothing and made no indication that I'd heard them, but my heart was pounding because now I was sure my old lady had to be Mrs Bixler. For days after this, I could think of nothing but Mrs Bixler and how horrible life must have been in this house. I started to get angry, imagining how scared and how sad her children must have been. I've never been able to tolerate a bully, and in my mind, that's all she was. I hit my breaking point a week or so later. I was once again bringing a bundle of laundry downstairs, and I realised she was there. She was standing under the basement stairs, motionless. I said, I know who you are, Mrs Bixler. You died here, and you weren't a nice lady, and now you're stuck. This is our house now, so you should go away. Nobody likes you. Her usual blank expression shifted into what was clearly rage, but she didn't move. Too afraid to see what she may do next, I turned around and ran as quick as I could up those stairs. From then on, her appearances became less and less frequent. I'm not sure if her hold on the house was fading or if our confrontation had somehow weakened her. Either way, Mrs Bixler slowly became less and less present, and for the next eight years, home was relatively peaceful. However, just as I thought I was finished with Mrs Bixler, she made it known that she wasn't finished with me. And the last time I saw her was by far the most upsetting. I had just turned 16, and being a self-absorbed teenager, I hadn't really given her a thought for years at that point. One night, I dreamt I was out in our backyard. In the centre, there was a massive oak tree that shaded the entire yard, and even towered over the house. In my dream... There were photographs of all my family members, parents, siblings, aunts and uncles, etc., tucked into the branches throughout the tree. And under the tree was Mrs. Bixler. She pulled something out of the pocket of her housecoat, turned and smiled at me. In her hand, she held a box of matches. She struck one and then dropped it in the box at the base of the tree. Flames flashed up like the tree itself had been soaked in gasoline. I ran towards it, actually becoming airborne as I got closer. I circled around the tree, trying to pull out every photo I came across as I went. When I reached the top, I started to relax a bit, thinking I'd finally collected them all. That's when I heard it. She was laughing. A sickening, evil laugh. It was only then that I saw what I'd missed. A picture of my great-grandmother was still in the tree and quickly being consumed by the fire. I tried desperately to reach it and pull it to safety, but it crumbled to ash in my hand. Mrs Bixler continued to laugh and I started to scream. I sat bolt upright in my bed and was still screaming when I felt my sister shaking me. I snapped out of it, slowing my breath and trying to focus on my clearly distressed little sister. Mum is on the phone with Grandma and something's wrong. She's crying. Nobody had to tell me what had my mother so upset. I already knew. 
my granny was dead and because I'd missed that picture in my dream. I was sure it was my fault. My uncle had come to her house to pick her up for church and he let himself in when she didn't answer. He found her sitting on her sofa with her head propped up on her hand as though she just dozed off. The adults all assured me she died peacefully, but I can't help but wonder if Mrs Bixler somehow managed to take her from us. She never appeared to me again, and I moved out of that house to start college 18 months later. I have lived the rest of my life feeling somehow responsible for the death of my sweet granny. I know it may seem stupid, but I keep thinking that maybe if I hadn't provoked Mrs Bixler all of those years ago, she wouldn't have harmed someone I loved so dearly. I have no proof that's what happened, of course, but to me, the dream I had that night was far too pointed to have been a simple coincidence. It's really taken a weight off my shoulders to finally share my experience with someone. Thank you again for providing people like me with a safe space to tell our stories. With love and gratitude. But M's story doesn't end there. Because just days later, I receive the following update. Sorry to bother you with another message so soon after the first, but there's been a recent development in regard to my experience and I thought I should share it with you and your listeners. I was at my mother's for the recent Easter holiday. We were all sat at the dining table and she randomly brought up our old house. She said, Your dad and I had so many problems in our marriage whilst we lived there. We just weren't ourselves at all. You'll probably think this sounds crazy, but I think there was something evil in that house. Well, I was shocked. But if there was ever a time to tell her about my experiences, this was it. She took the information in and said, Well, you know... That house was originally in a completely different part of the county and they moved the entire thing into that town. Who knows what that might do to any spirits attached to it. Then she dropped the real bombshell. She admitted that she and my dad had owned a Ouija board at the time and had used it quite a bit when we first moved into that house. They only stopped when my uncle saw it and told them how dangerous it could be. Now, I had no idea either of my parents had even seen a Ouija board, let alone owned or used one. You see, they're deeply religious people, and it's so surprising to find that they would tamper with anything even remotely connected with the occult. So, maybe the upheaval of literally moving the entire house or the invitation of my parents' Ouija board sessions played a part in Mrs Bixler's haunting. To my mind, it seems certain to be one or the other. I'd love to know what you and your listeners think. Thanks again for taking the time to tell my true paranormal experience. M. Well, first and foremost, a huge thank you for such an amazing submission. I'm being 100% truthful when I say my own version of Mrs Bixler from your story is staying a bit longer than I'd like in my head. But interestingly, the addendum at the end of your experience struck a chord with me. Because my father is a Roman Catholic and he has no time for anything paranormal or the world of the occult or anything along those lines. However, last week we attended a family funeral and an elder cousin of mine told me that his father, my uncle, had said to him 
he can never have a Ouija board in the house, following a story he was told about my own father. Now this struck me as a surprise given my dad knows what I do for a living and that he's never shared this story with me. However, my eldest cousin, with a few drinks flowing, leant over the table and said to my dad he'd not been allowed a Ouija board because of an experience that apparently happened to him and asked my dad to relay his story. I've never seen my dad so uncomfortable or nervous as he relayed in as fewer words as possible the fact that he and his friends attempted a Ouija board and made contact with somebody's past granddad and that the event overall had freaked him out so much he was in complete agreement that a Ouija board should never be brought into the home. And it's amazed me ever since that day that even at the age of 43, I'm still finding little paranormal secrets about my own family. However, M, I would like to say that your experience with Mrs Bixler is certainly one that's going to stick with me unfortunately, for quite a while. I'd like to thank each and every one of our listeners for choosing to spend your time with me here on your show. For our Patreons, I will speak to you on Sunday for another instalment of Dark Bites. And for everyone, I'll see you next week for Episode 3 of Season 11. And trust me, if you haven't already hit subscribe on your podcatcher, you'll want to do so for next week's episode. But until then, remember, when you're discussing the paranormal, always try and leave some of your disbelief at the door. And I'll see you next time, right here on The Dark Paranormal. new spring deals are here at Lowe's. Get top deals on everything you need to freshen up your yard, like the Cobalt 24-volt String Trimmer and Leaf Blower Combo Kit, only at Lowe's. Was $1.99, now just $1.49. Plus, get your lawn in shape with up to $15 off select Scott's Easy Seed Lawn Repair Mixes. Lowe's knows spring. Lowe's knows home improvement. Offers valid through 517. Selection varies by location. While supplies last, Scott's offer excludes Alaska and Hawaii.